hi everybody thank you so much for coming we're um we're here representing home front farmers today and we're just um just really glad to be here and really glad to get such a good turnout could i get a show of hands of who is doing a home garden this year or thinking about it great nice. so that's pretty much everybody came to the right place um as you know this session is going to be about planning your 2023 garden and um, basically we're just going to take you through the steps of how we plan our gardens and some of the tools that we use. Press the correct button here. All right. <laughs> All right, here, there you go. Um, we already had a lovely introduction from Elaine, but just to recap, uh, my name is Allison. Um, I graduated from UConn. And recently I was working for nonprofits, doing nonprofit management, but after an unexpected layoff, um, I decided that I wanted to work outside again. Um, so luckily I found this opportunity with Homefront and I'm loving it. I've been with the company for um, about a year and a half. So pretty new, but feeling like an old hat at it already. <laughs> Um, I'm also pretty new to the company, but not new to working outside. Um, I've been farming specifically for almost 11 years and now entering more into the gardening world um, and more, yeah, micro, micro growing. So I'm feeling really excited to have you guys plan your garden. So uh, just to give you an overview of the session, um, these are the steps that we take to plan our gardens. Um, first thing you got to do is assess your garden, assess the conditions, all that good stuff. Choose your crops, map out your garden area, order seeds and transplants, add any soil or amendments that need to be added, and last but not least, follow through with your plants. So we're going to go through each one of those steps in a little more detail, what that looks like at our company. All right, step one, assess your garden. So choosing the best spot on your property. Um, light is obviously a big factor where you're gonna have the most sun um, and south facing is best for a location. Um, and we can dive more into this, but planting specific crops facing the south as well, um, giving them the optimal light, really important. Um, prepping your soil or analyzing your soil is a really good place to start and incredibly important. If you're working with bad soil, your plants are not going to thrive or survive. Um, so we use UMass Extension for our soil testing program, um, but there are some really nice at-home kits that you can do as well that can give you the basics. Um, so you're just getting an idea of what you're working with is important. Loamy, Clay, Sandy, they're all going to have different um, properties to them. So we can dive more into that after, but it's a good place to start for sure. Yeah. When you get soil testing, they kind of give you an overview of all the most important nutrients that you're looking for. But for, as some of you guys might already know, the three most important nutrients that we're looking at are um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Did I get that right? Sure yeah. did. Okay. I <laughs> always get mixed up when you get nervous when you're speaking in front of people. Um, and you're also going to be looking at the pH. Um, most vegetables like a pretty acidic soil. Um, but like I said, these soil tests, they come with like a pretty detailed analysis for those of you who are interested in getting in into the nitty gritty. Um, this slide is just an example of what our soil test results look like we've got all this good info over here you can see you know they test for some heavy metals um, we've got down here we've got our nitrogen phosphorus potassium we've got calcium here and um, we do raised beds which they tend to be like a little bit over rich in nutrients so it's rare that you're gonna have to supplement anything um, in-ground beds are kind of a different story. And just to point out the soil pH here, it's at 6.6. .6. That's pretty good for pH for a garden. Um, 
you seem like six and seven point five is but the ideal is like six point five to seven for a pH. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've we've got our organic matter down here too. This one's at I think that says eleven point eight percent. That's you know it, that's like it's high. It's it's good though. I think we want to be between I don't know six to eight percent is probably the ideal. And you know if it's lower than that, you want to add compost. All right, number two, choose your crops. This is the fun part. Get to cozy up with your seed catalog <laughs> and do some window shopping. Um, let's see. Um, so you can use what you learned in step one about you know whether your garden is sunny or shady um, to inform what you can and can't grow. So for example, our solanaceous plants like tomatoes and peppers, those need a lot of sunlight to thrive. Whereas something like beans and lettuce, um, they can handle a little bit of shade. But you know, pretty much all your plants are going to need some level of sunshine, of course. Um, so let's see. This screenshot here is our. It's a screenshot of our um, crop planner, which we send out to all our clients at the end of you know the previous season, so that they can take a look at what we offer and what they want to have in their gardens for next year. Um, another important thing to do at this stage, you know, I know I talked about the seed catalog, but there might be some things that you want to grow from a transplant rather than a seed. Um, obviously, there are plenty of options around here for nurseries. Um, we get a lot of our stuff from Gilberties, like stuff that we don't grow in our greenhouse. We get our herbs from them and certain things. They're really great. map out the garden this is also the fun part um but can be very intimidating you know really if you're a first timer um so we use grow veg it's very handy for mapping your garden out you can kind of draw in your layout um it's really blueprinted nicely with spacing and um bringing everything to scale and so yeah, you want to measure your garden out or know the dimensions of the beds you're growing in and have it as accurately as possible um, laid out. And when you're choosing your crops as well, it's important to read the back of the packet or read the description and find out what the spacing is going to be for each crop, um, ideally, and that will help you map this out. Um, for example, tomatoes want 18 to 24 inches in between each plant. So if you're just doing a small raised bed, you know, three feet long, you might only be able to get one or two tomatoes in there. And you can fit things in, in between, but just, yeah, when you're choosing your crops, make sure you know how much space you're working with as well. Um, make sure to rotate the families each year, depending on the size of your garden. It can be a little bit trickier, but try your best just for pesky disease to not plant things in the exact same space as you did last year, especially for soil-borne diseases and fungal infections. It's really important with tomatoes and solanaceous to get those in a different location. Yeah, the nice thing about grow veg, Taylor mentioned the spacing, which is really important. The nice thing about grow veg is that it's when you lay everything out, the spacing is pre-programmed in there. So if you draw your garden out correctly with the correct dimensions, then it should, you know, when you drag the little tomato across, the spacing should be correct on there. So that's really handy. Or order seeds. I feel like I already said this, but <laughs> um, you will now is the time. I will say, like, we might be a little late for certain things that are very sought after, um, but you definitely can still order seeds now. Um, just a few of our, you know, companies that we order from, uh, we order a lot from Johnny's, um, High Mowing, Fedco, Hudson Valley Seed Co., and many others. Um, but our company does organic gardening so we are typically looking for organic seed but whatever you do is you know up to your preference of course um and then you are going to have to determine what you're going to grow from seed versus transplant that will require like a little bit of research um but yeah it could be as simple as just um doing a little google search or even you know just going to the nursery and like seeing what they even have for transplants Step five, 
as a soil compost and fertilizer. Um, so yeah, you want to renovate your beds and get them prepped for spring planting. So if you need to add more soil to your raised bed, if it's super low, we always recommend just for cost effectiveness, doing like a 50-50 topsoil and compost mix. Also, that helps not bring in too much organic matter. If you're doing straight compost, that can be a little bit too much. Um, for us, if it's the raised beds looking good, we will always add in just a sprinkle, um, a quarter of an inch of compost, and that's just to give it some micro, micronutrients, microorganisms getting going in there. Um, but the best time to do this is in the fall, just so when spring comes, you're just ready to rock and roll. All right, follow through with the plan. This seems like a very obvious step, but it can be hard. Like, you know, it's it's easy to get really excited and caught up in the planning and then not follow through with the plan. So we definitely want to do that. Um, have fun and enjoy the process. The nice thing for you guys as home gardeners is that it's it's just like a fun and joyful experiment, unlike for me when I'm doing it for a client. So just make sure you enjoy it and like, don't worry about perfection and make mistakes and just enjoy it. It's so great. Um, we really want to stress if you want to take it to the next level, um, the importance of record keeping, just making a lot of notes throughout the season, taking pictures maybe of any like pests or diseases that you notice or something that did really well. And also, you know, that you can remember, you know, maybe you made last minute changes to your plan and you forgot to update your grow veg. Um, it's good to have photos of what was going on. Um, it can be interesting to kind of keep a record of when things were blooming or fruiting, um, just because, you know, you can get the timing right every year and you can see how the weather is different every year. And just to add on to that kind of in the opposite direction is things are not going to go to go as planned in the garden. So of course, try your best. And I think what I was saying is like, have that grit with gardening where you're not just like, I'm over it. <laughs> just keep trying, you know, and things will probably go wrong. Take records of it, take notes, see if you want to try and diagnose it. There's the internet is incredible for that. Um, and just go with the flow too. And try not to get discouraged because you're going to have successes. You're going to have failures. So just celebrate the successes and take the failures in stride. All right, so that was pretty much the end of our main presentation before we go into the Q&A. But before we do that, I just wanted to, you know, let us know, let you guys know a little bit about what we're about. So we do, um, we build gardens and we do maintenance throughout the year. Um, and if you're interested in our services, um, our contact info is here. This presentation will be sent out at the end. And we also have some flyers up on the piano if you want to grab one before you leave. Um, yeah, we are located at 130 Pickett's Ridge Road in Reading. And we are, you know, it's not really, you know, that's it's just like where we work out of, but we are open to the public if you ever wanted to swing by for a visit. We love visitors. Um, we are also hiring right now. So if you know somebody who would be a good fit, um, you can email Zach at homefrontfarmers.com. And like I said, this presentation will be emailed out so that you have that email address. Also, we're having a plant sale May 13th, there you go. right? Yep. At the farm in Reading. And I manage the greenhouse and I'm, we have tons of beautiful offerings. So we will have certified organic plants for sale. May 13th, pretty much full day worth of yes. fun activities. There'll be a band. It's going to be a great time. Yeah. And we'll just stress that our transplants are rocking. So rocking, ready to go. Definitely swing by and get yeah. them. I guess um, that is the end of our presentation. So we'll love to open it up to any questions that you guys and may have. And don't be shy. There's no bad questions exactly. or stupid questions. Mm -hmm. Oh. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Starting plants from seed, it can be hard to do if you don't have a greenhouse on your property. Um, that's why I guess a lot of people, I think a lot of home gardeners do buy transplants. Um, there are a lot of things that you can start directly from seed in the garden, like 
carrots, uh, maybe squash. Trying to think, you know, radishes, radishes, cheese, beans, yeah, baby kale. There's all kinds of things you can start from seed. Um, if you, you know, if you do want to start things from seed, like indoors, there are ways to do it. Like you, there's um, like racks you can buy with grow lights. We have a coworker who does it at her house, and she's got like a whole little setup um, in her, like in her kitchen. It's pretty cool. Um, so there are ways that you can do it indoors. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people that come to me with questions about starting seeds indoors who are not having success. Their plants are really tall and kind of mm -hmm. leggy. It's a lighting issue. Yeah. So they just, they need a certain amount of light and they're just, it's hard to give that to them just in a normal home setting, unless you have like a grow light set up and maybe a heat mat, but that's not to discourage you because you can still plant those and they might be successful. Um, and then yeah, planting direct seeding into your garden. There's a lot of crops that you can do that with. The, I think, main issue there that makes me a little bit nervous is it's more susceptible to being eaten. Mm -hmm. So if, like, you plant a sunflower seed, <laughs> squirrels will dig it up and eat it. And if you plant a transplant, it's just giving it more time to be established. Um, but I love direct seeding. And so, yeah, it's not to discourage you, but it's a little bit trickier. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. The question was any comments on watering, um, watering the garden or seedlings or both the garden. So we install or we use drip irrigation in our garden, which is a pretty easy install. It's basically like lines of tape, plastic tape that have holes punched, usually like 18 inches apart. And it's on, a, it's on like a timer schedule or you turn it on and it will just run and distribute water evenly. So that's one way, if you don't have a lot of time in your day to water, you can set up irrigation through a company or yourself, it's pretty simple. Um, or just get out there early in the morning, morning and evenings are the best time, midday, not so much. Um, and surprisingly, a lot of plants get killed by overwatering. So, you should, um, a good way to tell if the soil is damp enough is to just go in there and try to make a ball. And when you let go, it should stay together. It shouldn't be like sopping wet or squishy, but it also shouldn't just like crumble apart. It should be like a nice little ball. And uh, yeah, that's how I tell. Yeah, and also the most important times to water is right after transplanting or direct seeding. You want for like two weeks them to have water every day. After that point, it doesn't need to be every day unless it's 102 degrees out and we're in a drought like last summer. Um, so yeah, I think let the plants get established. And then honestly, like tomatoes, for example, they d don't overwater them or they're gonna crack. So each, yeah, like carrots, for example, they're not gonna germinate unless they are consistently moist. So each crop is gonna have kind of its, its own needs. And so you can kind of either just water the garden in the morning and just kind of see what happens or depending on what you want to do, really dial in for each crop's needs. But yeah, twice a day, morning and evening is best if you're going to do hand watering. That's a great question. I usually just- Oh, my, repeat the question. Oh, yes. The question was when you are testing the soil, how far deep do you dig down? And what I do is I just take my trowel. It's probably like, you know, six inches, maybe a little more. And I just dig down in there. Yeah, that's, it's not super crucial as long as you get like under the surface. And so what I, the way that I do it is I usually, I don't, I've actually never used a home test, but the way that I take the soil sample is I try to take from different areas of the garden since you've got different things growing in different spots. Um, it's important to like, get a few from a few different areas, mix it together in a bucket, and then use that as your soil sample. Let it dry out a little bit. Yep, yep. And then put it in a bag and send it in. Yep. Yes. <laughs> the question was suggestions for avoiding squash vine borers. And I just will, 
I, I don't know if you want to take this one, but it's it's very difficult. It's pretty much impossible to yeah. avoid, unfortunately. Um, there's a there's a couple wacky methods out there for home <laughs> gardeners that could work. For example, wrapping the stems in tin foil or saran wrap, or making collars for your your squash plant with cardboard. Essentially, just protecting the the stem, um, the vine. But there's also some really gross incisions that you can do into the vine and actually remove the vine borer. But I feel like at that point in the season, everyone is already over zucchini, but that yes. could just be me. Yes. Um, so yeah, that's, it's a, it's a really tricky one for home gardening. It looks like a little grub, like the, the, well, the adult stage is like a red beetle. It's very beautiful, actually. Um, and then it's it's the larva that get in there. It just looks like a tiny little white grub. And you can tell when your plant has been attacked because like, first of all, it'll look sad and droopy. Hopefully you can catch it before then, but you'll see the the poop. We call it, we call it frass. It's like a little orange clump on the stem. And where you see that, that's where you know they've burrowed in. Another um way to kind of extend your squash season is planting in successions which we can talk about but you can plant like an early squash crop and then maybe throw a nut rip those out if they're starting to get infected or kind of teetering out and then plant another one and they'll produce through the fall so yeah so the question was asking about successions and timing for planting outside with the frost and running out of space specifically in the greenhouse. <laughs> That's awesome, first of all. Um, so there are some plants that you can set outside and all of your plants, if you have a greenhouse, you're gonna wanna harden them off before they go into the ground. So essentially giving them some sunlight, some wind, exposing them to the elements and then bringing them back into safety. So I would start doing that now with like kale, chard, lettuce, onions, all the brassicas as we call them, and alliums, they can start, they can handle the, the cold. So any cold tolerant crops, you can start bringing them outside for a little bit. Um, or if it's a cloudy day, you can leave them outside for the day if you're gone, and then maybe bring them back in uh, at night. So that should create a little bit of spacing. And once they're hardened off for a few days, they can hang out outside. Obviously, if we're gonna get snow or a torrential downpour, you wanna do something about that and keep them safe, but they, those can get moved outside. And you can start bringing your plants outside as it starts to warm, um, warm up. And then I would say I wouldn't plant anything out necessarily in the ground until after last frost. But again, you probably could get away with planting your brassicas outside and maybe covering them in some, some frost protectant fabric. Um, yeah, as soon as the soil can be worked, I, I feel like I'd be comfortable with that. The question is what fertilizer do we use? Um, the main thing that we use. Um, to when we start seeds or we do transplants, um, we start with a granular fertilizer. It's it's called ProGrow, and it's you know it's five, three, four, and those numbers are like the ratios of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Um, so you know if you just Google like general high nitrogen fertilizer, that's the key is you want something high nitrogen to start off your leafy green plants. Um, another thing that we use is fish emulsion. It is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> it smells really disgusting, but it is amazing. The plants love it, especially those new baby green plants. It's so healthy for them. Um, as you get, so, so you want to fertilize upon planting. And then, um, you know, as you get further into season, um, you know, you can be fertilizing every couple of weeks with, with whatever you want to use. Um, for fruiting and flowering crops, you want to use something um, with higher phosphorus, and that's another thing that you can just Google or go to your local garden store and ask for, you know, fertilizer for fruiting crops. Um, and so the phosphorus will really help along like the fruit and the flower production. I'm a big fan of um, diatomaceous earth. I really like sprinkling that for caterpillars. Um, and grubs, that's a good one. I'm not 
it's super big it just spraying so maybe you want to touch more on yeah basic control and yeah that. just for anybody who doesn't know diatomaceous earth is like it's a powder it's a white powder and it's like um it's like silica almost it's like very if when the insects consume it it's like very sharp and it kills them is that a good explanation <laughs> yeah or surround which is saline clay yeah so i like powdered solutions more yeah but yeah that can be great like before you plant the garden just like sprinkle some and mix it in um in terms of like spraying for aphids like i personally i don't find aphids to be like a super destructive pest i don't know if that's an unpopular gardening opinion but you know usually you can you know if you have a plant with a really bad infestation you can you know just take it out and put it in the garbage so that it doesn't infect the rest um i know some people have had success with just like spraying the plant off, like so they mechanically like come off. Um, we do use everything we use at our company is um, an organic spray that you can just grab at the garden store. But like for caterpillars, we use something called BT. Is just like um, it's a microorganism that kills soft-bodied insects. Um, so you can spray that for caterpillars or cabbage loopers. I'm trying to think some of the other common things we spray for. Um, flea beetles, um, you could use something called spinosad. There's lots of options. I would um, also throw in there before spraying, maybe look for beneficial insects yeah. or when you're planting your garden, use a companion planting. Like I always found nasturtiums are a really good trap crop for aphids. Yeah. They'll swarm through the nasturtiums and leave whatever is alone. Um, there are plants work together, so there are so many neat benefits from planting certain things next to each other. Like, for example, onions will repel carrot flies. So it's easy. Like we keep saying, Google it, but <laughs> I mean, so there, there, you can really get creative and kind of set your garden up for success before that happens. Yeah. Again, with the agrabond, the row cover I was suggesting for the frost protection, putting that on your early crops is like really a nice solution to get them established before any invasions come. Also beneficial insects, ladybugs, um, native praying mantids, parasitic wasps, nematodes, you can really go crazy, but they're really effective. Now, I don't think the trellis, using the same trellis would affect um, that, but it doesn't hurt to sanitize it just like get some alcohol or some concentrated hydrogen peroxide. And you always want to sanitize your tools, your trellises, your cages, ideally for any fungal or yeah, viral infection. So they can definitely reuse it, but I would try and sanitize it. Yeah. Just to jump in, the question was, there's somebody on the Zoom that has a problem with mosaic virus, and they're asking if the trellis could like transmit that. Um, yeah. So mosaic or I'm sorry, it was, I think it was their beans that had mosaic virus. Okay, um, mosaic virus, I've seen it a lot on cucumbers too. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty common. It, it's called mosaic because on the leaf, it like little squares, they start to turn yellow on the leaf. Very pretty, but you know, we don't like it. Um, so it is, you know, Taylor was saying like, it, it's always good to sanitize your stuff, but like mosaic virus, probably isn't spreading that way. Um, that kind of thing spreads uh, through insects. You know, they carry it and then when they land on the plant and they put their little mouth parts in there, they transmit the virus. <laughs> That's kind of cool. The question was, uh, <laughs> the, the question was about cross-pollination um, and these folks in the audience had a cucumber and a watermelon cross and they can very interesting looking fruit. I'm going to let you take this one. <laughs> Honestly, it's a hard question. Like, it depends on how much growing space you have. I think that, I feel like it's <laughs> sort of inevitable. I mean, you could always, some people get crazy about it and they'll actually like net the flowers and then hand pollinate it. It'd be really more dialed in. Um, but it's kind of just, it's happened to me so many times as well, where I'm just kind of like, oh, there's that. Um, yeah, I don't really have a great answer, honestly. Shift your mindset and think of it as a gift. 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but seriously, I think that's where like rotating crop families and keeping them separate is really dialed in. Maybe trying to confuse or putting certain plants in between or using like different biological barriers maybe could be effective. Um, I'm always a big fan of adding flowers in around everything. I think it just kind of mixes things up well, um, brings in a lot of beneficials. I don't know specifically if that would deter that from happening, but my gut says yes. Yeah, so the question is just asking about mixing flowers in to the vegetable garden. Um, yeah, it's incredibly beneficial. I mean, it adds beauty. There are a lot of edible flowers out there, um, which is really nice throw in salads. But in terms of beneficial insects, it's really important. They can attract really um, specialty insects like these parasitic wasps I was talking about that can then take care of certain pest issues. Flowers will attract those type of insects, um, especially ladybugs is like a big one that marigolds will attract and then ladybugs will eat the aphids. So um, and also just plant diversity, I think is really important um, just for the soil health. I feel like the, um, yeah, the, the, the microorganisms in the soil all re respond differently to different root properties and it just adds for overall soil health and plant health. Um, but flowers are such good companions because they don't need a lot. They're, they're not gonna take up too much space. I mean, some will vertically, but you can kind of just fit them into the garden. They're not going to zap too many nutrients from your, your vegetables. Um, and I think, yeah, they can kind of maybe confuse pests. Like I was saying with the nasturtiums, they can act as trap crops or genuinely just confuse certain, certain beetles and stuff like that. So highly beneficial. Yeah, okay, so for direct seeding, it's a very good question. The question is if you're direct seeding, um, in ground or in raised beds, and you can't necessarily mulch around your plants because they haven't germinated yet how to keep the weeds at bay. I'll just say this first and foremost, weeds love compacted soil and overworked soil. So the less you can do, unless your soil is super compacted and you need to turn it, the, the less you do to it, the less disruption it faces, the less weeds will come up. So um, let's say you break your bed, you add your compost and mix that in just really lightly on the top layer and you feed it your carrots. Um, carrots is a tough example because they're tricky germinating, but let's go for it. Um, and you, just weed identification is so crucial. And so knowing what's popping up specifically, um, but there's, there's really fun tools you can use like little pine weeders. And if you seeded your carrots, say, you know, you have two inches in between each row or four inches. You can get little little tools that will just, you can kind of rake through it. But I would wait until germination before, unless it's like an obvious weed popping up and you're like, okay, I know that's not supposed to be there, just pull it. But once things germinate, it sounds brutal, but I'm always just get down and, you know, hands and knees and just pull in between them um, so you're just not disturbing it as much. Because even if you're using a tool, it can just bring more weed seed up to the surface. The question is about a newly renovated piece of property that had mugwort in it with super compacted soil from machinery or, so mugwort is one of those plants where you don't want to rip up the roots. So my suggestion would be, unless you are dying to plant it this season, if you're having a long-term goal for growing food in this plot, I would cover it with landscape fabric. Like, yeah, <laughs> I would. You could do really heavy layer of leaves and wood chips. If you, you know, it would be, people would drop off free wood chips to you, but, and leaves, but you don't always necessarily know if it has weed seed or what, but I always recommend that. Landscape fabric can just smother it throughout the summer. Um, and then over the fall, I would mulch it heavily with leaves and wood chips get some soil building going and then see what happens in spring. The mugwort will pop up pretty quickly. And if it does, maybe do another little solarizing or just try and pull it as it comes up. I don't know the size of the space, but yeah. 
That's awesome. Yeah. So I would, I would really landscape fabric and try to smother as much as you can. And then the compaction, I'm not as worried about because if you're going to add layers on and build soil, then um, I'd rather you not disturb the soil. But yeah, leaves, then wood chips, then topsoil, then compost. Get like a nice layer of cake going. Leaves, wood chips, um, topsoil, and then compost. Yes, the thicker, the better. <laughs> the question is about controlling voles. Um, we definitely have problems with voles in our gardens. Um, I mean, as, as a homeowner, I mean, you can get rid of them however you want. Like uh, we as a company, like, you know, I just told my clients, like, just put out traps. You know, we as a company are not licensed to deal with pests, but you can, um, you can put out traps. Um, I feel like we try to keep them out with, like, putting landscape fabric on the bottom of the garden before we build it. But they get in, you know, like, things break down and, it, and they get in. It's hard. Yeah, there's some solar powered oh, yes. frequency things that they sell on Amazon. It's like, gives off this really high pitched underground noise that apparently can repel moles and voles. I've actually found it to be somewhat efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is, again, with the flowers, there's certain plants that you could plant that probably will deter them, even though they're underground, they're not gonna like the taste or smell of those roots. I can't name them any off the top of my head because I'm on the spot, but again, Google. Um, but yeah. The, the question was about drip lines um, and just like general how to lay them out in the soil and all that good stuff. Um, we, so when you lay a drip line, it should be on the surface. I, I mean, you can vary them, but that's what we do. We put it on the surface with the holes facing up. Um, in terms of brands, like we don't, so we don't install irrigation. We usually, you know, inform our clients to find a company that is really good at it. Um, I can't think of any brands, but like you can, you just go to any, you know, uh, what am I trying to say? Hardware store, they'll have drip tape. Um, and, you know, any drip tape is good. It'll be the kind that you go and buy yourself will be a little bit like flimsier than what you could get from like, you know, a company like Summer Rain, for example, but it does the job. Yeah. And just to add on to that, if you are going to be installing your own drip, just get the parts to repair it because yes. what happened is you're going to get a leak and then you're not going to know what to do. You're going to get overwhelmed. Or you're going to either turn it off or just let it leak into the garden and then the discouragement will come along. So it's they're very easy to repair drip, drip lines. Just cut it in half and they make these parts where you just attach it, screw it on, and it's good to go. So that'd be my suggestion. If you're gonna do drip to make sure you have the pieces to repair it, which all of this is very cheap. Yeah, so. I just wanna to stress too, like how worth it, it is. I have a few clients that do hand watering and it's just like, it's such a pain for them, you know? But, you know, in, in the summer, it's so hot last year, having to go out there twice a day. And like, then when you go on vacation, you got to figure it out. So if you can get this drip system set up, you know, that's going to be so much of your time saved. Overhead watering is okay with the sprinkler. Yes, you just want to be careful because it can wilt your plants. Like they can basically, if they have water on their leaves and the sun is reflecting them, it can burn holes. It can just kind of stress them out a little bit. And if you have too much water going, it's too hot out, too humid, the plant is just going to basically be like, what do you want me to do? I can't take in all this water right now because it's, it's trying to breathe on its own, you know? And so it's kind of, I would say if you can go out in the morning and get your sprinkler going, if that's the system that works for your property and your timing, I'm not, I don't think it's an, a huge issue, but um, I would just like Al was saying after a few times doing that, just check the soil, make sure it's reaching all the corners and yeah, it's really like saturating it enough. Um, but it's not one of those things you want to just leave on all day. Your plants will not appreciate it. Um, for those on the zoom, the question was about, uh, uh, these seed sheets that like have the seeds already planted into them from gardener supply. I personally have never heard of that yeah my gut is saying I wouldn't recommend it um 
but I've also, I don't think I've heard of that. Yeah. I, is it like a paper material? Like it will disintegrate? No details. Yeah, if it was some material that would break down and maybe like, for example, cow pots are cool because they break down the soil and they also fertilize your plant. If it's something like that, I think that could be cool, but I'd have to know more specific. I would just say, um, if you're going to do something like that, you're going to want to keep your eye on it, the process more. I, the I, question is, is it easy to grow blueberries? I would say it depends on whether you have the right conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the soil will need to be a certain acidity. Blueberries like it a little more acidic than, you know, like vegetables, for example. Um, they do make, you know, special fertilizer that you can put in. And, you know, it's also important to make sure they're getting the adequate light. Um, I've, I've definitely tried to grow blueberries. Like I used to do school gardens and we had some blueberries. Somebody donated them and just like planted them. And they were on like the wrong side of the hill and they just like didn't produce. The other major issue is that um, the birds will get them. So, <laughs> so you want to have some kind of enclosure or, you know, you can build like a frame and then put a net over it. Um, that protection is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. it will be a bush. It will oh. be a bush and it will need to be pruned every year. It's, it's fairly easy. You can, you know, get a book or watch a YouTube video about it. I also like wet soil. Yeah. If you have any, have any wetlands on your property, which I know us Reading folk definitely do, they do like wet soil. Yes. Yeah, the question is about growing cilantro without it bolting immediately. Um, and it's, I mean, the answer is just that cilantro is a cool weather crop. Um, we plant our cilantro out in the garden in April. Um, you know, we have transplants and yeah, probably just getting like a really nice transplant from wherever and planting it early. They like the chili. Yeah. Yeah, you could not necessarily like it definitely will benefit from the light. Um, but yeah, just making sure it's, you know, it doesn't like the hot weather. I, I do feel like that a lot of my clients and like people in general, they, they're not necessarily aware of that. Like, you know, asking like, why is there no, I wanted to pickle my cucumbers, there's no dill, but like dill and cilantro, they like the cool weather. So I would say just load up in the spring and the fall and get your fix. <laughs> yeah. Chicken fertilizer is a question, how to apply in your garden. You don't want to add any raw manure onto your, your gardens. I would incorporate it into your compost, or if you have a compost pile, start incorporating it into that. It is very, uh, yeah, it's definitely great to add into your garden. Highly recommend. Um, that goes for most manures, but you want to give it like at least a year of being starting to break down and not being fresh. Chipmunks and what was the other one? Chipmunks and stink bugs. Stink bugs. I've never really had an issue with stink bugs in the garden. I'm wondering if they're confusing them with squash, squash bugs. bugs. Probably, yes. Yes, they look very similar. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, for the chipmunks, um, I'm sorry. Did they say specifically what the chipmunks are eating? Sunflower heads. Sunflower heads. Ugh, I don't know. <laughs> it's just hard. Um, you know, if you're comfortable with uh, violence against animals, then you can take your BB gun and <laughs> camp out for a little bit. But you know, other than that, it's just very, it's just very difficult. They harvest your sunflowers before they're fully open. Yeah. yeah. Pest issues last year, chipmunks and squirrels eating tomatoes. And so I'm wondering if this person really struggled last year with the drought, we yeah. found that the animals were just living in the garden. Yeah. And who can blame them? Yeah. For not so much for sunflowers, but for, you know, I know the chipmunks were really ravenous with the tomatoes and even my cucumbers last year. And um, that can be, you know, solved with like a, for the tomatoes, like you can get a really good enclosure. Um, we build like wooden enclosures that have like a door with wire on them and everything. It's really, you know, it's like a pretty, uh, you know, heavy duty kind of solution that, you know, not everybody may be into, but it does work. Um, there are some, you know, cheaper things. Like I have a client who has, 
you know, just something they bought off Gardener Supply and it's like a metal frame with a net over it. And, you know, you would think they might crawl under there, but they don't, you know, sometimes just having a physical barrier will deter them enough. Um, as for this, the stink bugs, which I'm assuming, you know, we're just assuming this person is seeing squash bugs, which they basically, they're on, you see them on the squash, they look very similar to a stink bug and they just like suck the life out of the vine. Um, you could do what, like pheromone traps maybe. Um, yeah, there's certain sticky traps, yeah. yellow, blue, pheromone traps that you can put in the garden that work well. Um, also looking for the eggs on plants, going out and inspecting yes. the underside of the leaves for squash bug, That's potato right. beetle. That's like going out there and with gloves on, squishing all the eggs. It's not fun, but it works. <laughs> what I do is I take duct tape and I just, <laughs> and they yeah. come right off. Um, Snow Hill buying compost is the question. I know there's a farm in Easton, Snow, Snow Farm or Snow Hill Farm. Yeah. They make really good compost as well as uh, New England compost. If you need a lot, I've always used a uh, New Milford compost and we use Golia out of Stanford. Um, but if it's for just a small raised bed, I'm sure Home Depot sells some nice quality. I just wouldn't necessarily recommend Mir miracle Grow. Trying to stay away from anything that says miracle when it comes to garden. A lot of the photos we've shown you are of like smaller gardens. So like, yeah, it would be weird. Like a deer probably couldn't jump in there and you know, they probably yeah. wouldn't want to do that, but you know, some bigger gardens, it might be easier for them to do it. <laughs> Great question. Question was um, about fall winter crops and when you should plant them. So I'm assuming that they're talking about things that you can harvest later on in the season. Yeah. Um, so there's a variety of different things that can grow throughout the fall and winter. Um, let's start with winter specifically. Um, carrots, parsnips, leeks, some turnips, um, some greens like mustard greens. You can overwinter kale. Um, depending on the winter, kohlrabi. So your brassicas and um, certain root crops can overwinter and you can pick them throughout that season. And you wanna, you wanna let them either be at their maturity by winter or basically almost there. Cause it, again, it's about um, hours of daylight. If they're in the winter, we're not getting enough daylight for plants to fully mature. So for example, a kale plant, you would want to plant it in, you know, maybe end of August or even July and let it get more mature. And then you can have that throughout the winter and it would even start growing again in the spring. Um, or Brussels sprouts, broccoli, those aren't really gonna overwinter, but those are really nice in the fall. So it depends, for example, carrots are sometimes 60 to 90 days to maturity. So that's like a two to three month window from when you're gonna seed it to when it, you're gonna harvest it. So each crop is gonna have its own length until it's gonna be fully mature. And so you just wanna look at what you want in your garden in the winter and the fall, and then kind of calculate back towards when you're gonna to need to get that started. Um, certain greens can last under that frost protection, arugula, um, some Swiss chard. So you can have a productive cold season garden, certain herbs like the cilantro. Um, and then, winter squash, which is one of my favorites. You probably want to start that seed in early July and transplant it out and then you can get a nice um, storage crop. So, yeah. I think you covered it. Yeah, like certain radishes you can grow in the winter as well. Um, they might get a little bit mealy, but good for a soup, so. Mm -hmm. um there's some artichokes although i wouldn't recommend planting those because they spread a lot but they are really delicious we have yeah we have the question was tomato varieties thank you yes we have so many i should have brought a crop planner but like we have so many tomato varieties that we love 
um, just to go through some of our tried and true, um, we, uh, let's see, we, the Cherokee carbon is great, which is a cross between a carbon and a Cherokee purple. Really great, has great success with that this year. Um, mortgage lifter. Um, we love the striped Germans if you like a big yellow tomato. Um, in terms of the cherry tomatoes, um, sun golds, everybody loves sun gold tomatoes. It's a very little orange tomato, they're so sweet and delicious. Um, we've had success with certain red cherry varieties more than others. The one we had last year we didn't like. I can't remember what it was called. And you weren't there, so I'm sorry. I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, well, San Marzano's. Yes. All of our Amish tomatoes. Tomatoes. Yeah. Speckled Roman. Mortgage Lifter is a great tomato. All the brandy wines I'm a big fan of. Mm -hmm. um, those are just classic heirloom, big slicers. Um, yeah, my favorite tomato is called the Terracotta. It's like an orange tomato. It's stunning. It's an heirloom, very old um, variety. But yeah, Sun Golds are classic. Any of the bumbles, like there's like pink bumble. And, uh, you can also on the seed companies, they'll kind of in the descriptions be like, these are the tried and true. Or they'll be, this is some wacky variety that came from this guy's basement. And it really will be from someone's basement. But um, does that answer your question? I would say if you're going to try and plant some paste, some big slicers, some midsize, and then some cherries. And they're all going to kind of ripen at different points. And yeah, they'll, they'll love it. They love being in the greenhouse. And you'll get a long season with them. Just stay on top of pruning. Make sure they have plenty of space ventilation because the biggest thing with the greenhouse is high humidity means more fungal issues and tomatoes are of course super prone to that so if you can get a fan in there going um and again with the drip and especially in the greenhouse trying to water them at the root level and not get not splashing any spores around or anything but they'll love it the question is about how to prune tomatoes so um First, you have to make sure that your tomato is an indeterminate variety. So that's the kind that grows up and up and up versus the kind that grows out in a bush. So that it will say on, you know, if, you're, if you have a seed packet or if you Google the variety or, or when you go to buy it at the store. Determinate tomatoes only grow a certain, to a certain size, so you don't want to prune them. But for your indeterminate tomatoes, um, you know, for those of you who may not know, they just get taller and taller and taller in theory. Um, <laughs> so when you're pruning, you want to prune off what we call the suckers. I wish I had a photo. I mm. would make this a lot easier to explain. But basically, you know, you have the stem and then you'll have the leaves coming out. Like, you know, like this. Here's a stem. Here's a couple of leaves. And the suckers will start growing out of the armpit here. And you just want to you know, with clean hands, you might want to Purell, pinch them. Um, they might start to get bigger before you can catch them, at which point you can just, you know, take your scissors and clip with clean scissors. So you might want to let one of them develop. Like if you see one that's like lower to the ground and looking really strong, you can let that develop into like another main vine and like clip it on a trellis. Um, and you know, I I don't like to have more than two. We call them leaders. Um, I don't like to have more than two leaders because it starts to get messy. Um, yeah, and you just want to always make sure that um, we carry like a little bottle of you know alcohol. I spray my hands, spray my tools between plants, just to make sure everything's clean. And you also want to make sure you're not pruning on a day that it has just rained or that it's going to rain because um, when the tomato has like an open wound, so to speak, and then, you know, the rain hits the ground and the dirt splashes up that, you know, tomatoes are extremely susceptible to diseases and that can make them catch a soil borne disease. And if that happens, prune off any infected leaves. And also it is sometimes nice to 
prune up a little bit for that exact reason. So maybe have like the first foot or foot yeah. and a half of your plant pretty much pruned. That's just for that. Yeah, and while we're on the topic of tomatoes really quickly, when you're planting them, you can plant them incredibly deep. They will respond very well to that, like even just having the top layer of leaves poking out. Um, and if your soil is a little bit too compacted for that, you can plant them sideways and kind of just slip them in just so you can really get them in deep and let their roots really, really establish themselves. Thank you guys. Thank you.